Now we can turn it back down. For the purposes of the tape, this is the session uh, titled Best Kept Secrets, subject of which is the Choreographic Guidelines booklet. Uh, we will be recording this session on tape, so please remember uh, when you ask questions from the floor, uh, we'll get the microphone to you. We do not have a remote mic in here, so uh, you will have to come up front to uh, reach one of the microphones. Uh, my name is Elmer Claycomb. I'm the chairman of the Choreographic Applications Committee. And uh, one of the things that we've done some years ago was to uh, develop the booklet called the uh, Choreographic Guidelines, and that will be the subject of our, uh, this session. I'd like to introduce our panel members. First of all, on my left is Ron Counts, who is our uh, vice chairman. Uh, Ron is from Colorado Springs and uh, knew him some years ago when I was in Colorado Springs and I moved away and uh, a year ago we had an opening as we shift around on the choreographic applications committee and he became our vice chairman. The gentleman over on our right hand side, we all know him, very few of us can pronounce his last name, but it's John Kaltenthaler. I've been practicing that for many years. I've also been practicing no badge, no food, no way. I knew there was some problem. <laughs> um, as I said, the subject of this session is the Choreographic Guidelines book that was compiled by our committee some years ago. I'm going to give you some background, first of all, not of how the book was compiled, but really why we're back visiting it again. Um, the Square Dance Issues Committee uh, that was convened several years ago, looking at what were the primary issues in the Square Dance activity, identified the problem of overemphasis on choreographic complexity as being one of the primary issues that we need to deal with. That group of problems was referred to our committee. And we started looking at what could we do, and we uh, came up with a whole group of ideas, new publications, uh, newsletters, programs, etc., etc. And we had one voice in the darkness that said, hey guys, we've already done it. Jay Clausen had been on the committee when a lot of this work was done, and he said, the choreographic guidelines covers everything we're talking about. And most of us right on the committee said, well, yeah, we remember doing this thing somewhat, but uh, maybe we ought to go back and look at it. In my case, yes, I had edited parts of it or read parts of it. I won't even say edited them. Um, but I'd never read the whole thing as a unit. It had just been little pieces. So I started going back and reading through the whole uh, document, and I began to realize, yes, there was a reason Jay was saying this, is this document works our way through the, uh, I'm not going to call it the mechanics of square dance calling, it's a whole lot more than that, that, that takes you from the beginning to kind of the end and puts things in good perspective as they go, go along. Um, then as I started trying to find out a little bit more about it, I began to talk to some of the people who were given credit for the book. I happened to be over in Hawaii doing a festival with uh, Bill Peters last year, and I said, say, Bill, uh, you're given credit for some of the work in Choreographic Guidelines book. And he says, what book's that? The Choreographic Guidelines put out. Bill has never read it. Did not know that his material was used in it. Don Beck, I cornered out in the hall here a little while ago, and I says, Don, would you come in and talk a little bit about your input to choreographic guidelines? Choreographic what? Choreographic guidelines, the book that gives you credit for using your material. Don had not read it. Now, I don't mean this as a, as a trick question or anything. How many of you here do have that publication? Just have it. Okay, that's 15%. Just picking up doesn't count. <laughs> now, how many of you have how many of you have read it and use it in any extent? Okay. I believe we have a very good group of candidates 
for this program. And, and we're going to do, we want to do two things. Number one is, I want to convince all of you to go out and buy the book and use it. And number two, I want you to tell other people about it, because that's our campaign, is to let people know this publication exists, that it is a tremendous tool, and to disseminate it. So you're our core group to run out in the hall, catch people, tell them to go get it, and we're hoping that all the copies that are here at Caller Lab are gone when we get done. Uh, they're almost gone now, all right? Well, we'll make them reprint it. Uh, and that's the core of the problem. Very few of the, the books were sold. Uh, many of them were sold probably were stuck into something and people never read them. And uh, with, uh, with that as kind of preface, what we're going to do is uh, Ron really has been using it as a basis for some uh, caller training sessions. He's going to be talking about how he's used it in that. Uh, this guy over here. Well, he's got some reason for being here. <laughs> um, was uh, involved in actually writing the book, uh, editing it, has a lot of background on uh, how it was put together, and uh, any of the rest of you who had any involvement in it and that are using it, we want your input. The other thing will be questions. Oh, Jerry Reed. Hello, Jerry. Jerry was the chairman of Choreographic Applications when uh, the book was published. I don't. Were you on the committee when it was started being put together? So you became chairman during the preparation. Okay. Why don't Why don't we let you get yours? Because I know you've got to go on to other things, and we'll get the panel underway. Jerry's comment again is he'll like it better Wednesday afternoon. All right. Thank, thanks, Elmer. And and uh, it's a pl pleasure to see so many people at this session. It's great. Uh, just a, a very quick background. Um, I actually the uh, the committee the very first. Uh, chairman that I know of was Charlie Muff, and is it Muff? Yeah. And then Stan Burdick uh, took over, and then I, when Stan retired from or left the committee, then I took over from Stan, and then Wayne Morvant, and then uh, Elmer. Uh, during the time that I was uh, the chairman. We looked at our charter, and one of the things that it said we should do is to create books, uh, documents similar to the choreographic guidelines book. What we did, we looked around at all of the material that was available on those subjects that we felt should be included in the book, and we found it difficult to find anything written on some of those subjects, uh, written and published. There were uh, color lab handouts, uh, there were um, tr color training people that are materials that uh, individual caller trainers were using in their curriculum, but there was no place where it was all put together in one place. So um, I would sit in front of my computer and start banging out stuff, and then I would send it to, uh, there was an ad hoc committee of, of people to review it. Uh, John was on it. Um, Elmer, I believe, was on it also at that time. Um, I can't remember all the names. Kenny Ferris uh, comes to mind. There were several, uh, an ad hoc committee of maybe five or six people that we that we bounced all this stuff up, up, upon. And um, over the period of about two or three years, uh, began collecting information from Bill Peters. Um, uh, I'm I'm uh, disappointed that Bill doesn't remember, but not surprised. Uh, yeah, I had gone to Bill and said, uh, "I have some of your the material that you've written. Do you have a, a problem with me including in the in the book?" And he said, uh, "No. At least that's what my records show." <laughs> And uh, uh, and I did that with uh, with the, uh, the stuff that Jim Mayo has written, uh, I, a lot of the timing stuff that John has worked on. So all of the authors or all of the authors of all the various material uh, were included in the book, and I tried to give that um, uh, credit uh, as I could uh, I, as I could find it. But the bottom line was that uh, it's a tremendous amount of material that's not written in any one place. Uh, anywhere, and some of the material in there, we couldn't find a record of it being written anywhere. 
So um, it, it's a tremendous document, at least uh, we believe so, and we still believe so. And when Elmer uh, contacted me about doing a session like this, um, after, well, actually, I think he probably contacted me last year, and we didn't get it on the convention planning, and then uh, um, I looked at what we were doing and, and what we could do, and this was a, was a, a very, very good idea, and I appreciate Elmer bringing it up to me again. And we obviously able to get it on the program, and like I say, very pleased to see as many of you here as, as there are, because uh, we believe that it's a tremendous document. And uh, with that, I will turn it back to Elmer, and and uh, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks, Elmer. Thanks, Jerry. Now I got it right. All right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anticipating Wednesday afternoon, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what I'd like to do is uh, slide the mic over to John because of some more of his background of how things were put together on this originally. Uh, let him kind of take the next piece of it and then... Uh, uh, again, if you have questions maybe about what is in the, the book as it goes along, uh, you know, say, does it cover so-and-so? The chances are, yes, it does. And one, kind of one thing, this is not the end all. What this does is, is a lot of it is, is just get you going to where then you can go look for more things, but the thoughts that are in it, it's just, it's just so logical to carry yourself through. And I recommend it not just for new callers. And a lot of people think it's just for a newer caller, less experienced. I go back and reread it now time after time. And my normal comment is, you know, dang it, I know that, but I'm not doing it. Thank you, Albert. Um, when we put this together, this also happened about the same time that we came out with the tactical supplement to the curriculum guidelines for caller training. The idea was that we wanted to come up with a relatively short document that could be used by callers to assist them in their own personal development. The technical supplement referred to the curriculum guidelines that was used by people who were formerly training other callers. The curriculum guideline had the topics that were broken down into the must know, must present, uh, to the should present, and it is desirable to present. And the technical supplement gave the details of how to go about the conduct of that training. This document was designed as the information on the individual level in unsupervised training or in self-improvement. And what we did was we took the subjects of the curriculum guideline and those things for which we had handouts that we had used in Caller Lab discussions at Caller Lab and at the Caller Lab seminars at the National Square Dance Convention for formalized training and revised those documents so that the individual callers could have that information to say, geez, I knew that, but I'm not using it. How can I incorporate this into what I'm doing? A, if you have the book, you know that the contents state the purpose of the booklet, and then we go into individual chapters on smooth dancing, on anticipation, on the accuracy of the execution, choreographic management, or how do you control all this stuff, degree of difficulty, selection of moves, and how you get successful with difficult choreography. A couple of very interesting chapters when John Sabalski was working for Xerox, they allowed him 10% of his time to be used on any subject of his choice, not necessarily related to the business of Xerox. He chose to write about the degree of difficulty. Now, that may sound like, wow, how altruistic can Xerox get? In reality, it was, because John is a very intelligent person, and he put together... Ten factors which affect degree of difficulty. And these are all outlined in here. Obviously, such things as if you don't know the move, it's harder to do. Yeah, yeah, duh. <laughs> but 
maybe there are other things if we call the move from an unfamiliar formation or we call it from an unfamiliar arrangement that's going to be more difficult than the plain vanilla or standard arrangement and similarly that if you went with some of these things that you could find that if you combine various factors maybe we're asking the dancers to remember too much or we didn't put it in such a way that it it felt right well what the heck is going on is that better now okay we'll try to do that otherwise i'll just learn how to project <clears throat> the the factors of degree of difficulty are often overlooked by callers. When you talk to callers about teaching, you sometimes ask them, why did you select that as the second formation and arrangement from which you teach something? And if you've never thought about it, let's take the example of load the boat. We all know that we will teach that from standard facing lines to begin with. And their center four dancers have a perceived correct position so that the second easiest way for the dancers to do it would be if you had the boys on the right and the girls on the left because all four center dancers are in their normally perceived normal position that's an important consideration of teaching because of the degree of difficulty the most difficult one would be the half sashayed line of four because nobody in the center four would be in the normally perceived position so that sort of concept of suddenly coming to the realization we can control our difficulty led us to write with that as an analysis some of the things of how we def to get success with a difficult set of choreography the session on smooth dancing we expanded a little bit on the timing because timing is a critical nature of your presentation as an individual caller. There are other things of smooth dancing with the introduction of the word kinesiology, which a lot of people can't spell. K-I-N-E-S-ology. I mean, it's very simple. Um, anticipation. We teach dancers not to anticipate, and yet we encourage them to anticipate, don't we? Forward, up, and back, you reel. Pass through and what? Bend the line, right? Not hardly. We have conditioned them to anticipate that what we are going to call. I have a friend of mine who is in Oklahoma City, and he always says, ladies lead, flutter wheel. If I hear ladies lead, what, am I, what call am I expecting? Dixie style. Dixie style. You all say that. What's my body going to do when I hear ladies lead? I'm going to be moving to the right to anticipate the action that I'm supposed to do for Ladies Lead Dixie style. If he says Ladies Lead Flutter Wheel, what do I have to do? Oops, I gotta go the other way. Does that mean it's gonna be more difficult? You bet. Does that mean that he has misled me? You bet. Does he get upset when I tell him that? You bet. He said, I hope we never have to get to that degree of regimentation. And yet, we have done that in our calling, haven't we? We have done that by habitually saying, ladies lead Dixie style, where that becomes the accepted norm of the anticipated flow of, of the words and the flow of the bodies. And that, incidentally, the kinesiology is the understanding of the movement of the body and the muscles required and so forth if you get into some of these things you also need to worry about the accuracy of execution so we decided we would put in a chapter on that and of course all of these things are nice to have as theoretical but how do you control it what do you as a caller do in order to control you, the things that you are calling what method of control are you going to use? So we put a session in on that. Sometimes we call this formation management. Others we call it choreographic management. You can't just do this stuff in a vacuum. And then we had also we had certain training aids which we would use 
and we would recommend that you use one of the finest individual choreographic tools for us as individuals is the call analysis sheet. How many of you have that and use that? Oh, I hope I see more than just three hands. That single tool as a method for self-improvement is probably the most single invaluable aid you can get. All of these training aids, if you will, or handouts that we have used, I shouldn't say all, that would be misleading. Most of these are available through the home office. For single copies, there is no charge. If you're doing a clinic for your local association and you wonder what topic you should present, let me suggest choreographic or call analysis sheet is a perfect starting place because what it does, it says what's the name of the call, what's the definition of the call, from what formation does it start, is there a particular arrangement that is necessary, what hands are involved, what hand is required to be free, what is the ending formation, which hand is then free, how long does it take to do it, what are good preceding or follow-on calls to that call. If I said ladies lead to a Dixie style, we all know that the best call after that is left swing through, right? No. Why not? What's the analysis that you have to go through as a caller to understand what's going to flow naturally after a ladies lead Dixie style? The centers, in this case the boys, are coming together. What hand is available? The right hand, what do the boys want to do? They want to go to the right Therefore, trade or cross-run would be appropriate calls, wouldn't they? Well, by understanding that and by focusing that on the call analysis sheet, we have a better understanding of the call Dixie style. And we would not call Dixie style to a wave to a left swing through. It would be uncomfortable for the centers, and we learn that by using this call analysis sheet. That was the purpose of establishing this choreographic guidelines booklet. And that's the approach that we took when we decided on the chapters we would include. And when we then took the documented material which was written, and then we said we were going to revise it slightly, expand it in some cases, and put it together in this booklet. My suggestion is if you're working with newer callers or working even with experienced callers, and you want to have them do some training work, use this book. If they're brand new callers, get the starter kit for new callers first. That's in its third publication now. And then get this kind of book, and then take it apart and, and work with the individual callers. And you'll find that these tools are available to help the new and even the experienced callers become better callers because they've gone through the self-improvement techniques. With that as a background... Anybody have any questions as to what we did or why we did it? We feel free to ask them. In sitting here and listening to uh, John, everything that he said is in the book, other than I don't think the section on the formation awareness chart. I don't remember that being referred to. It might it might be, but I don't remember that. But the rest of it, he's going along, and I'd think, let's see, that's about page so-and-so. The, the, these are really things that are covered very thoroughly in such a way that you can follow it through by working with it. Now, let's let uh, Ron talk about how he's been using it in his uh, uh, training sessions and things like that. Thank you. Part of the guidance I got from Elmer earlier on was uh, that the committee and Caller Lab was going to stress or de-emphasize choreographic complexity. And I mentioned that at one of our caller meetings, oh, probably late fall. And uh, they suggested, well, we ought to have some caller training on it. And... I ended up with the task of putting together a caller clinic designed to cover the things that are contained in here. I spent probably somewhere close to 100 hours pouring through this book, going back and cross-checking a bunch of stuff. I've been calling for over 25 years, and some things still were 
puzzling me. Why do the men want to do a courtesy turn on a square through after this second hand pull by? The answer is in here. Now, in a lot of ways, the book is kind of like reading the Bible. You've got to infer some things from it. A lot of stuff is spelled out very clearly, but it's not a recipe book. It doesn't tell you to add this and put it in this order and do such and such in a sequential manner. So in preparation for this caller session, it lasted about three hours. I did it uh, about two weeks ago. We had nine callers in attendance. They ranged in experience from one decided about three months ago that maybe he would be interested in learning to call, and he'd been doing a little bit of reading, to Jeff Palmer, who calls through Advanced and does a lot of weekends with some of the big names in the industry. So I started off following the things in the book, many of which John just mentioned, why we do certain things in certain orders. I took them through some of these things uh, just as a concept and got a square up on the floor, and we started to work through a few things. I see when I'm dancing... A lot of times a caller will call a star through and veer to the left. Men callers. They're killing the ladies doing that. I'm surprised there aren't more knees blown out from that. The lady, that star through, she's moving to the right, and now she's got to plant it and come back to the left. So while we had to square up, I called that one. And the men, they thought, oh, that's great stuff. Okay, let's get back in the same starting position. Star through and veer to the right. Whap. Hit them right between the eyes with that. The men, that's terrible. Now they know how it feels. Another problem that I had seen several times was um, coming into the middle in uh, the lessons before you'd gotten up to where you could do a lot of stuff. The caller would have all couples paired, move them in the middle and start to, well, how am I going to get to an alaman left here? And they'd do a lady's chain in the middle. And not a whole lot of room when you are in a starting double pass-through to do a lady's chain in the middle. There's ways to get the, the ladies switched so that you can do a square through three or whatever. I like to get them to the outside and get them back in, get them unpaired, get them back in to the middle. Um, other things I see less experienced callers doing a square through three and a right and left through. You're in a starting double pass through a square through three and then... Right hand pull by left hand pull by right hand pull by the right hands back here. Now do a right and left through. You need somebody like Wyatt Earp to get it back up there fast enough to do that right and left through. I had seen I had seen dancers moving through right and left throughs and square throughs where they had the proper hand available. No problem with dancer flow moving to it. They were learning the calls. They were reinforcing the calls. But then I would see this set up to where the square through three and then a right and left through. And it's just like you had walked into the sliding glass door. The dancers are there and, and, and they're confused. Why do I do this? What am I supposed to do? Did I do something wrong? And when we mistreat the dancers early on and keep mistreating them all the way through a session, there's no re- uh, wonder that we lose as many as we do. Going back to the thing on why the men do the courtesy turn on the square through, I had tried all kind of crazy things to get them to move and always turn toward the center. I've gone so far as to put a stool in the middle of the square. I've gone so far as gotten in the middle of the square myself and bend the stool to get them to turn toward me. 
And what I had begun to think about this was that we got a guy here that is uncoordinated. He doesn't follow instructions well. But I read in the book that what he was doing was very, very natural. He was following the natural tendency. He does a right pull by and he goes that way, does a left pull by. And the natural tendency after that left pull by was to go a little bit to the left so he could come back to the right. But if you do, to demonstrate that thing, if you have that gent and the lady hold hands just a moment too long, the guy is off balance. He's looking for something to grab onto to keep from falling on his duff in the middle of the square. He's using the lady as a cane. We went through that with the demo square, and we we have a pretty good uh, representation of lady callers in our association, and we were paired up in normal male-female couple arrangements, and the lady said, there's nothing wrong with that. Said, Let's go back through it. I always, I don't have any trouble after the second hand pull by, turning the proper direction. It's not a problem for the right-hand dancer. We switched it over and let the ladies get over in the men's normal slot, hold on just a moment longer. Wow, I see what you mean now. Well, by having the book and knowing that, I don't have to use a stool anymore. And it has just a variety of things like this in it that you can go to. The nine callers that we had in the group, I had them to do a little bit of work on setting up a square, going from a static square to the four primary positions. Zero box, cross the street box, lead right box, and a zero line. I just asked them to write a couple of modules to, to get the square to each of those. We took a break. We came back, and we played around a little bit. And then I gave them some choreography that Jerry Junk had dropped off with us when he had done a caller clinic for us two or three years ago. This was labeled my favorite bad choreography. Contained something like 54 calls. And I broke those down. I didn't know how many callers to expect at the clinic. I broke them down in bite-sized chunks. About 11 calls each. Diagrammed the things out, dollied them all the way through. And I gave these out to caller teams, two or three callers per team, asking them to look it over, and here's your mission. When we get the dancers back up, we're going to dance the bad stuff. One of you call the bad stuff so that the dancers get the feel of some of the... Th All the calls were legal, but bad judgment to use them in the order that we're in. Then I want you to put in things, anything you want to do to smooth it out. And you don't have to end up in the same uh, ending formation as shown on the sheet. And as we went through it, you could see the frowns on the faces. You could see the stop and go character of the dance. Then they put things in to smooth it out. And we got crosstalk from the other called why did you do that there what would have happened had we done this and he gets some suggestions kit was heading up a, a team of callers that you had uh two that had only been calling something like a year they're just finishing their first class and they got through their stuff pretty good jeff palmer with 20 plus years and uh, the other caller he was paired with, uh, probably 14, 15 years, were able to breeze through the thing. But the cross talk and suggestions that came out from the trying to dance the rough stuff and trying to smooth it out, everybody just, just thought it went over really great. And um, I used the book in conjunction with the standard applications. 
I see in our area that the standard applications booklets need to be revised because things are now standard that were probably not standard or, or at least in that area as shown in the, in the book. Incidentally, that, incidentally, that, that handout. That handout is called My Favorite Bad Call, and you can get that from the office. It has some horrible, horrible examples of bad flow. Ron talked about the star through and veer left. If the timing is such that you've called the dance that combination of calls correctly, the dancers will accept it because it's not too much more than a basketball turn as a term used in round dancing or a lunge and recover. But the timing makes that acceptable and is widely used. I personally deplore it. There are other calls which I think are bad inherently when Ron's talking about the square through. All you have to do is figure if I'm walking by, what direction does my body try to turn? And it's going to be if I right hand walk by, I'm going to turn to the right. If I left hand walk by, I want to turn to the left. You'll notice I use the term walk by, not pull by. I don't use the term pull by when I'm teaching because pull by implies that you must hold hands. Walk by says as the shoulders pass, you drop hands. Those are techniques you can use to help you overcome a difficult spot. When we look at that favorite bad call, not only are they covered in the smooth dancing portion of space available, Hand availability, as he alluded to in the square through three quarters to a right and left through, with a hand not being available, you understand that if I square through to a star through, it's not bad, but a square through to a slide through is better because of hand availability. Years ago, we used to always say never use the same hand twice in a row. But if you do a star through, is the man's right hand available for a right and left through? Sure, because it's in a position from which the male dancer can indeed do a right and left too. And, of course, the lady using her, her right hand is, is not being used in the star through, so it's certainly available for her. But a right hand, right hand may be acceptable if the hand is available. One of the other things in my favorite bad call, and picture this routine in your mind, if you will, head square through four. Swing through, boys run, couples circulate, couples trade, couples circulate, couples trade, f Ferris wheel. Ah, we call that sequential overflow. Bad sequential overflow. But the point is that as you do this at a caller's association meeting or a caller's training session, the people who are not dancing are laughing their fool heads off at the way the people up there are struggling. And all of these calls, my favorite bad call, were taken out of the center pages of a National Square Dance publication. Doesn't that scare you just a little bit? That we have people that are putting this stuff out and writing it and calling it? This book tries to eliminate some of that and show you how to avoid some of that. The essence of timing can affect the degree of difficulty to a major, major extent. And I think it's important for us to realize that. Everybody gives lip service to good timing. Not everybody can indeed perform proper timing or even good timing. Some of them get fairly close. But if you're only off one beat of music, that may only be a half a second. At 120 beats a minute, you're off one beat, that's a half a second. It can make a major, major difference in the feel of that dance. The booklet is a tremendous tool for you as individual callers. Learn to use it. Look at what it says. See if you can understand why it's saying what it is that it is saying. On a personal basis, the only way I ever use Chase Wright is after a walk and dodge. Because I think a pass through to a chase right or a square through three quarters to a chase right is terrible flow for the ladies. 
And when I analyze the choreography that I'm using, I try to consider not only the man's part, but the lady's part, not only the active couple's part, but the inactive couple's part, as ex exemplified by that couple's couple circulate, couple's trade, couple circulate kind of thing. And I think that's the intent of what we try to do with this book. And if you don't have the book, seriously, we would urge you to get that book. And it presents a marvelous, marvelous talk for your local associations to do as a workshop sometime. If you really want to have fun, get that My Favorite Bad Call and say, I want eight volunteers and watch them dance it. Aside from the fact that the choreography doesn't get you to your corner, it's fun to watch. All right. Now, Don, have you figured out what part of this they swiped from you? Maybe they just borrowed your name and thought it would be impressive that way. <laughs> uh, I was looking through the, uh, you may recall I said at the beginning that part of what caused us to go back and look at the choreographic guidelines and try to start getting people to use it was the charge from the Leadership Issues Committee. And uh, here was the charge that they passed along to the Choreographic Applications Committee. It says, overemphasis on choreographic complexity. And there were a list of, of items, uh, A through K. Uh, it says, it can also be described as underemphasis on other non-choreographic techniques. And you know, some of those things are, and I don't know if this is really saying the same thing they mean, meant, but timing, body flow, things that don't have to just do with the, the geometrics of the dancing per se, but how does it fit together that we need to work on. So this book has, section one is smooth dancing. And I think that's putting things in the right order. So often we put some kind of geometrics in as the thing we're working with first, but smooth dancing is number one on the concerns. B, need to change caller's mindset. Complexity can spell disaster. People want fun and variety. Again, the book is designed to work down towards the end of it is when we talk about degree of def difficulty and working with difficult figures. It doesn't say that it's not important, but it's down the line in the, uh, the interest. C, choreo, gar choreo, <laughs> choreo needs to have variety uh, but not be mind-boggling. Boring choreography is just as detrimental. So there are sections that talk about uh, interesting choreography, uh, selection of moves to get those variations in it, but put in context. We call material too difficult for the average dancer. One of the sections defines the different ways that a person can either get through a dance or not get through it, and saying that it varies from the person who gets through it and is completely relaxed. The person that gets through it is hanging on by their eye teeth to it. They're sweating. They're not having an enjoyable time. Uh, and down to the place where somebody just doesn't get it. Well, you know, the person that doesn't get it is not having a good time. That person who is just barely making it through may not really be having a good time. They're, they're stressed too much. But if you go to the other end of that spectrum and the people don't ever get any variation, that may be nearly as bad as going too far the other way. But it's, I think, put into perspective again. Callers need to recognize how to achieve dancer success. Considerable dis discussion about how do you get the people through the material. And think about this, that dancer success varies so dramatically with the ability of the dancers, the level of your dance, the first night, that first beginner dancer class, getting people through things is just as important to those people as the advanced level, but the difference in your, your presentation, your material, and being able to walk up to that stage and judge the dancers out there and fit this together you know, it's a, you don't want to really stop and think about what you have to do as to can I really do this and how do I learn it. I've, I've, I say today, the new caller who takes on becoming a caller today, I have the tremendous admiration for. I don't know if I could do it. I don't know if I'd have the, the fortitude to do it. I started calling completely traditional. My four records that I could carry around, I wasn't like the new 
modern caller that that, that those were the only four records that, that I have and all the other callers have all kinds of other records, it's because those are the only four records that the group of people that I called to danced. You know, Alabama Jubilee, Red River Valley were fine for the two singing calls and, and two patter calls and you were in business. And then I got into the, the modern square dance movement adding one call at a time. And those calls would be in sets and order. They'd be the new selection for that month you know i can go back and find the issue and a lot of you guys can too when swing through was a new call ac Ducey was a new call well you learned them one at a time one of the things the book put points out and i never thought about is those of us who grew up with those one call at a time we learned it we danced it then we got another one we learned it we danced it Maybe good, maybe bad, but we got them in pieces. New callers today have this mountain. Well, how do you pull that mountain back down to size? We're trying to give you one of the, the tools to do that for the new caller. You know, that, geez, I wish I could deliver that and get people to go through it smoothly. And he does it, and he's just having a good old time. And... <laughs> And I'd sure like to learn how, Randy. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm saying it often leads to stop and go, but it doesn't have to. Limit choreographic complexity to one or two tips a night and warn dancers in advance so that those who are not interested can sit out. Now again, these are the suggestions or the thoughts that came through from the uh, issues committee to our group to uh, deal with. Again, it talks about how you might program your evening to where, where would it fit to have that more difficult tip. I, I wish John could bring this equipment that works. Brings his own microphone. Um, <laughs> it's just like walking into the dance and using the house mic, isn't it? <laughs> uh, next issue was uh, limit choreographic complexity. Okay, we already talked about that. We need to embrace the attitude that less is more. Uh, that's getting things out of the, the just the simple things and by using the other techniques instead of relying so much on choreographic complexity. Uh, suggest that caller lab committee develop some guidance and approaches to the use of calls in a distinctly different but successful manner. Well, that's something we'll probably be working on in the future. Right now, we're going to try and this little deal of crawling before we try walking and working with what we already have. Callers need continuing education on how to call with just a few calls. Uh, why don't we say yes, you do. And uh, you know, doing, I, I, I still believe that every year when I do the three-quarter dances, halfway dances for our class and club, I know I get more comments from the, the, the regular dancers about saying, that's the most enjoyable dance we've been to. Never used a plus figure one, but the floor moved all night. Everybody was dancing, and I worked my tail end off. Uh, callers need continuing education on how to call with just, okay, just a few calls. I'm just hitting the same ones. Caller needs to recognize and attempt to satisfy social dancers as well as technical dancers. And every one of those issues is addressed in this particular publication. Um, would like to see if any of you have questions before you all go to sleep. Uh, lunch is not going to be on the tables for just a little while, so you could ask questions and still get in. Uh, the panel members have any other thoughts before we try and get these people bombarding you? And please remember to use the microphone. Come on, come on. Don? Do you have a copy of it up there for people to watch? Don. <laughs> I intentionally didn't come up because I don't think this is beneficial to the tape, but do you have a copy of the book so that people can come up and thumb through it and see what's on it? For those of you that on the tape, buy one. <laughs> and I want to be noted that Don is the first one checking to see if his material really is in the book.
It says, came from the Tampa workshop conducted by Don Beck, Jim Mayo, and John Henderson. Don Beck. Yep, that's the name. <laughs> I have a comment. Uh, Kit Galvin, very often we are so we get so accustomed to this bad choreography that we think it's normal for example when we were conducting this collar clinic here in Colorado Springs the collars the women collars who were participating uh did this uh, veer to the uh, star through and veer to the left and they said oh that's not so bad but the proof was when we actually did it reverse and had it star through and star through and uh, veer right, then the men all yelled and said, oh, how bad it was. And I, 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 I know that most of the callers are, have been traditionally men, and so they don't often, as, as uh, we said, we, the men don't often think of the women's part. And uh, we now there are more of us women, so we can start... Uh, complaining and maybe correct some of these things. Yeah, but what the point that Kit's making is, is very true, but how do you overcome that? And the answer is with proper timing. If I give the call, star through, wait, wait, veer left, that's going to be terrible for the women. If I say star through, veer left, they know that they're going to be veering left, so they're going to prepare themselves by counter-dancing and that's covered under the smooth dancing segment, and they're going to do a basketball turn or a lunge and recover, and that will smooth it out. The men won't do that if you call star through and veer right, and that makes believers out of the people who think only of the man's part and fail to consider the women's part. That will eliminate the problem of the people, the callers who only think of the active couples rather than the inactive couples as well. When Cal Golden first recorded God Bless America, the figure was head square through four, swing through, boys run, couples circulate, wheel and deal, pass through and trade by. For the active couples, that's a good choreography. For the inactive couples, smaller and smaller concentric circles until you get to the pass through and trade by in which you disappear into yourself. That's the kind of thing that this book tries to point out to you. The ways in which you can use to prevent that by thinking in a different way. A lot of it is the attitude of the individual caller. In many instances, our attitudes need major adjustment. We need to think of the dancers. The dancers have been saying we want variety, not complexity. I do not believe the statement that when they say dancers are bored, I do believe in the statement that callers are boring. And there is a difference between those two statements. Dancers are not bored, but callers are boring. If a lot of you have taught new dancers for a long period of time, and you repeat this cycle in a multi-cycle program, we as individuals may get very tired of a particular record. I can recall over in Europe in 19, when Freddie and I were very active in teaching, and she said, if you play that Solomon Levi one more time, I'm going to break the record. But to the dancers that I was teaching, that was still a fun dance. To them, it was still new. To me, or to my wife, it was boring. And if... You know, our objective as callers is to sell the sizzle, not sell the steak. Anybody can sell steak. We need to sell the sizzle. And we do that through our showmanship, through our presentation techniques, by our understanding of the choreographic moves that we're asking the dancers to do. We have a great opportunity. We need to take advantage of it. And we need to let the dancers have a good time by staying out of their way. Uh, 
and now Don's figured out what part of the material was his. It's difficult not to talk sometimes. This is Don Beck from Massachusetts. This is reminding me of, of something. Um, you know, when you star through and veer one direction or another, whether it's comfortable or not, 20 years ago, plus or minus 10, Jim Mayo and I were discussing that and different other body flow aspects. Does this feel good? Does that not? And, you know, we could sit here like we are here and hypothesize about it for hours. We decided to find out by dancing and seeing what it felt like. And we got together four or five callers um, in the area and maybe two to four squares of dancers. And I rented a hall on a Sunday afternoon. And we got a workshop together, and we told the dancers, you know, we're going to do some stuff, and we want to hear your opinions, and we're going to talk about it. And we got down, and we danced. Star through Vera to the left was one that I danced the man's part. I danced the woman's part just to feel what it would feel like and made my decisions at that time because I was using it, calling it before, um, and I made the decision at that time that it's one of those borderline things. If it fits in, you know, because it felt okay, if you – timed the call and gave the dancers enough anticipation, especially if they learned how to bounce back and forth like women have to do. But we had a lot of things come out of that workshop. We just put a workshop together to answer a lot of our own questions on what was going on. Some of that you'll find in here. Many years later, we, Jim and I were talking about tempo. You know, does it make a difference whether you call it at 128 or, or 136 or 118? And we said, let's find out. And we invited, I, again, I rented a, a hall. We invited six callers, very notable callers from our area, some who were known to call very slow at slow tempos, some known to call at high, faster tempos. We invited about two, two and a half squares of, you know, each caller was to bring a couple couples of more experienced dancers. Um, and we did a variety of different tests to see what effect tempos have. What I'm doing now, and I guess that was the reference here, some of this information on tempo was from the results of our workshop. What I'm suggesting here is if you have questions on tempo, on body flow, on anything else, on different gimmicks, get a group together in your area. Hold a, a you know, a caller's clinic, but not necessarily a, a formal clinic where one person is presenting stuff, but just a bunch of knowledgeable people together. Run a workshop. See what you think. You know, bounce your ideas. I think it should be this way. I should be, think it should be this way. Try it. See how it feels. See how it goes over with the dancers. Respect the dancers' opinions and see what they say. And then step back and see what they really said. And then share your thoughts with us because that's what Jim and I did, and it's, I think, helped a lot of people too. You guys can do this too. You can work out stuff. Maybe this will give you some good ideas where to start with. And I think what's really exciting over seeing calling techniques develop over the years and, and, you know, reading everything I could when I was getting into this and knowing what's available now is that each generation of callers can build on the previous stuff and we keep refining it more and more. Granted, we're refining it too much at this point, but, you know, there's more to learn about. Um, you can build on this and learn new stuff or try and go through this stuff again and see whether you agree and maybe refine it different ways, you know. The, there's still a lot to do with, with degree of difficulty as to what causes and what isn't. There's some good guidelines here. Some of them are very technical and not all that practical. Other things, there's maybe some more practical ideas that can be supplemented, and a group of intelligent callers and dancers getting together can discover an awful lot. Um, there's a lot to be done, and it's fun when you get together and do it. So thoughts to continue with. And if you're going to do that, if you do it at your private home in a basement or something else, Plan to feed the dancers, but let them dance first. Then you then you give them the feed. Well, yeah, not only that, but if you feed them first, you say, oh, well, I really don't want to dance. I have a headache or whatever. So let them dance first and prove the point that you want in the workshop, and you'll get the participation. I think Ron Counts is standing up here because he figures that's the only way he's going to get the mic back. Well, I just wanted to kind of carry on couple of comments from what Don said. I thought he was going to cover it, but if you don't have the capability to get a group of callers together so you can cross-critique each other, tape your dance, then get a group of dancers together, play it back, and you get in there and dance both the ladies and the men's part, and you start to see 
is my choreography rough? Do I have that overflow? Am I stale? Am I running on a plane? What is going on with my choreography? Does it excite me as much to dance it as it excites me to call it? Ask yourself some tough questions, make notes on it, and then go about correcting it, and you'll be a much better caller. Thank you. And I was looking for what page Ron took that off of, because that's one of the specific recommendations here in the book. Um, we didn't expect this to be one of the sessions, like when you've got the super callers up here telling you how to do great showmanship. Uh, this is, is really kind of a working session. And... As we said, if we've, if we've sold you on the ideas that, that this is something that can build your calling skills in a whole large area, we've accomplished what we wanted. Uh, we'd like you to let other people know about it. Everybody can look at the booklet themselves, decide if they really want to get it. But I think those of us who have used it are, are really emphatic about its benefit to other people. The problem is it just has not been distributed. And it is not real technical in terms of the types of things you can't read. I, I get a hold of some of the material that's put out, and I just flat don't understand it. I've been, I've been calling for 40 years, and I don't understand it. Uh, the cost of, now, there is a little issue. I want you to know that Choreographic Application Committee formally asked the board to lower the cost of it. They respectfully declined. It is $18, but it's worth it. You know, it's not necessarily something great big that's that's uh, uh, that's worth the cost. This thing is is worth it because everything that's in it is usable. There's not a bunch of fluff that's that's there to make it big. It's just good material. So it is eighteen dollars available from the home office. We'd love to have it all out of print, so we have to print it again. If that happens, we've accomplished what we wanted to in this session. Uh, and unless anyone else, any questions? Ah. John Metcalf, Nixa, Missouri. I, I think that your star three veer to the left, not totally disagreeing with you, but I think you're not being really fair on that. Because if you put the boys in the center of a couple circulate, the first time they've ever tried it, and then ask the guys, you know, if their caller hadn't been calling this and they've not heard this before, they're going to tell you that's bad choreography. Veer to the right... If they haven't been used to it, even if it's reverse flutter and veer to the right, you're going to see people out there veer to the left and and go back and forth. And the callers, in fact, will make a, a joke about that, that a veer to the right is two steps to the left and then and then back to the to the right. Let let me let me comment on that because Kip Garvey had written a choreographic pattern in a, in a record, and he recut the record or put out uh, Sea of Heartbreak, in which the figure is heads lead right and veer left and the ladies trade, and the boys run and the all eight circulate. The all eight circulate for the men because they're not used to circulating in the center in, in and is going to be awkward initially. But the flow is good. If you say swing through from a standard head face your corner and step to a wave, or not step to a wave, head swing through and all eight circulate, for the boy that's gone, done the swing through and is going to, to face out, he wants to go to the right. The all eight circulate feels awkward because we're requiring him to go to the left and stay on the inside. But that's a part of your call analysis. It has nothing to do with whether the call is good or not, but rather how we've put it together with the preceding or follow-on calls that make that awkward for the dancers to do and entice them to vote one way or the other. It's bad choreographically. Uh, it's fun, and we did this over in Australia on uh, talking of the star through veer left. The timing makes that acceptable. We, I think we will probably agree it's not great, but it's not the worst call that we see examples of. But if the timing is right, it's reasonable because it becomes a lunge and recover or a basketball turn, which is very commonly done in, in round dancing. 
at the same point in time, if we can make the choreography smooth and to show correctly how Veer Wright can be good, I would use Ladies Lee Dixie style, now the boys trade and recycle and veer to the right because they end up normal with the girl on the boy's right. It will feel right to the dancers, which is one of the points in the degree of difficulty. The body flow is moving that way. The recycle is going that way so that the veer to the right feels natural. And because the dancers end up normal, girl on the boy's right, it feels right and they will accept it, and you'll never hear a bad word about Veer to the Right because we've presented it in a way that it feels right. And if you, if you try to understand the degree of difficulty and you try to understand what makes certain things feel right, and you can do that in your choreography, the dancers will accept it and love you for it. May, you know, one of my pet peeves is when Bumman says, call a hot hash tip. The caller then speeds up the tempo, clips his timing, and makes it awkward. I don't like DBD dancing. That's not what they're saying. They said, you embarrassed me by making it awkward. I didn't like that. So that's the difference in how we approach it. That's an attitudinal adjustment which the callers must make. And I think that this book points some of these things out that show you how to enable you to make it smooth. Make it acceptable. Make it feel right. And after all, it is the dancers who are the important part of this activity. If we didn't have dancers, we wouldn't need callers. It's like the expression to an uh, arrogant sales clerk in a store. They are overhead. We represent profit. Our dancers are our profit. We are the overhead. All right. Do we have any other questions? I hear them clapping in the next room. We'll expect the same thing from you. as. <laughs> Linda, thank you all for setting through the session. As I said, I know it wasn't one of those real uh, impressive, uh, learn a whole lot of things that you can go back maybe and use, and yet it probably is.